Hey guys, welcome to the pilot episode of Know the Law. Uh, so initially, I was going to start off this YouTube channel with my constitutional law series. However, due to recent developments of the Alec Manassian case, I'm going to start off with talking about what is not criminally responsible due to mental disorder. So if you guys don't know who Alec Manassian is, he's the guy that rented a van back in 2018, uh, drove southbound on Young after Finch, and uh, attempted and did uh, kill uh, 10 people. So before I begin, please listen or read this disclaimer. These videos I am making are a hobby of mine. Information contained in this video is for informational purposes only. You should not take it as legal advice. You should not act or refrain from acting due to any information in this video without first seeking legal advice from a licensed lawyer. If you need to find a lawyer, you can simply go on Google, the Law Society directory in your province, or you can call the Law Society to direct you to a lawyer. So let's begin with a little bit of history on this defense. This defense actually dates back all the way to 1843 in an English decision by the House of Lords in M. and McNaughton. Back then, the defense was called the insanity defense. And in order for this defense to be successful, it must be clearly proved that at the time of the committing of the act, the party accused was laboring under such a defect of reason from disease of the mind as not to know the nature and quality of the act he was doing, or if did know it, that he did not know he was doing what was wrong. As you'll see, the modern Section 16 mental disorder defense in the criminal code reflects this old insanity defense. However, before I continue on with the defense, there's two very basic criminal law concepts that you must know, and that's actus reus and mens rea. Very simply put, the actus reus is the act of the crime. So in Manassian's case, it's the act of operating the van to murder and attempt to murder. Mens rea is the state of mind of the accused. Under this element, there are sub-branches. For example, subjective mens rea and objective mens rea. Further under these sub-branches, there are more. For example, subjective mens rea can be established by intention and ulterior motive, knowledge, willful blindness, or recklessness. So I'm not going to go further into these two elements, as each element can probably be a video of its own. So in a nutshell, the Crown must prove beyond a reasonable doubt the actus reus and mens rea of the crime. So in Manassian's case, he's being charged with 10 counts of murder and 16 counts of attempted murder. I'm not going to go through attempts here, because attempts is another section of the criminal law. And if this defense is successful for murder, it'll automatically work for the attempts. So we're going to focus on section 229 of the criminal code, which is for murder, and uh, you'll see it on your screen right now. So the key elements for murder is to cause the death of a human being, and that is the actus reus. The mens rea under section 229A1 is means to cause his death. That's the state of mind. So for murder, it must be established that he caused the death of a human being and meant to cause his or her death. There are other forms of mens rea under section 229, which you can go and read, but that's the gist of uh, the murder here. And now, finally, on to the main topic of this video, what is not criminally responsible due to mental disorder. So this defense can actually be found under section 16 of the criminal code and the common law defense of automatism. So from what I have read, defense counsel for Nassian is only arguing under section 16 and not the common law defense of automatism. So what you'll see on your screen now is section 16 in the criminal code. So to establish the defense of mental disorder, the accused must first establish that he has a mental disorder. And second is that the disorder affected him in one or both ways described in the latter part of section 16 which is one, incapable of appreciating the nature and quality of an act or omission, or two, knowing that it was wrong. So the first thing we have to understand is what is mental disorder. Under section two of the criminal code, mental disorder means disease of the mind. So if you're initially confused of what is a mental disorder, you're probably just more confused now. And the fact that the statute does not provide a definition of disease of the mind doesn't help also. So in order for us to understand what is a disease of the mind, we have to look at case law. And the first case we're going to look at is R and Cooper. 
So I'm not going to read this paragraph by Justice Dixon. Uh, rather, I'm just going to go through the important points. First, he says in the legal sense. This means that disease of the mind is a legal rather than a medical concept. Further into the judgment, he made it more clearly, and I quote, In strictness, a medical witness is not entitled to state that a particular condition is or is not a disease of the mind, since this is a legal question, end quote. So a doctor or a psychiatrist is not entitled to determine whether the accused is suffering from a disease of the mind. This is up to the judge to decide. Second important takeaway is that he excludes self-induced conditions and transitory mental states. Third is the wording I have placed in blueprint. You probably have noticed that this wording is pretty much the same as section 16, which it is, but this case was decided 12 years before section 16 was enacted. And the definition of mentalist order was modified in R and Parks. Uh, this landmark case separated disease of the mind and automatism. This is a very interesting case. So Parks one morning drove to his in-law's place, killed his mother-in-law, and severely injur injured his father-in-law. And he did all that while sleepwalking. So after he woke up, he turned himself in in the police station, and uh, he was actually eventually acquitted. So the main takeaways from this case is that disease of the mind is a legal term and not a medical one, although it does contain a large medical component as well as legal and policy elements. Second, the Supreme Court of Canada held that sleepwalking was not a disease of the mind. Rather, it was non-insane automatism because it won't likely reoccur. Uh, the case actually says a lot more, but it's more geared towards automatism rather than the Section 16 defense, so I'm not going to go further. So the next two cases we have to look at are R and Stone, which limits the non-insane automatism defense, and R and Fortain, which provides a modified roadmap established in Stone to determine uh, non-insane and insane automatism. So this is what these two cases tell us. If the condition stems from an internal cause, then it's considered a disease of the mind. But note that even if it's not internal, it may still be considered a disease of the mind. And the trigger that caused the event to happen is a very important consideration. The question the judge will ask is whether a normal person in the same circumstances might have reacted to it by entering into an optimistic state. It will be external if the trigger was so extreme that would cause a normal person to disassociate. An example of this would be the accused killing a father's son or daughter in front of the father. That could be argued that anyone would go into a state of disso disassociation from that shock. Thus, that's an external cause and not considered a mental disorder. And if the condition is likely to reoccur, then it will be more likely treated as a disease of the mind. And there are also policy considerations, which include reputation of the administration of justice, ease of faking the mental disorder, uh, floodgates potential, and ensuring public safety. Now that we have a general idea of what is mental disorder, we move on to how it is proved. To begin, we first look at section 16, subsection 2, which states that everyone is presumed to be sane unless the contrary is proven on a balance of probabilities. Section 16, subsection 3, states that the defense is a reverse onus defense. So read together, this means that the accused bears the burden of proving the defense on a balance of probabilities. And this burden, according to R. and Fontaine, is an evidential and persuasive burden. An evidential burden is not an actual burden of proof. It determines whether an issue should be left to the trier of fact. To determine this, the error of reality test is used. The error of reality test asks whether there is any evidence on the record which a reasonable trier of fact, properly instructed and acting judicially, could deem the defense to succeed. This test is a question of law to be decided by the judge. So the, if the answer is positive to the error of reality test, then the judge must put the defense forward to the jury. If the answer is negative, then the defense fails. The persuasive burden is a question of fact on how the issue should be decided. 
The accused must prove all elements of the defense on a balance of probabilities. However, the Crown may disprove the burden beyond a reasonable doubt. So first, the judge, without weighing any of the evidence and assuming the truth of the evidence, must determine whether it passes the air of reality test. If it does, the defense is put into play. Then, the defense counsel must prove on a balance of probabilities that the accused suffers from a mental disorder and that the mental disorder made him incapable of appreciating the nature and quality of his act and or knowing that it was wrong. The jury will need to determine whether the defense succeeds by examining the reliability, credibility, and weight of the evidence. And it's almost always going to be uh, supported by doctors, psychiatrists, and or medical records. So just a brief note, previously I said that the common law defense of automatism can also lead to a verdict of not criminally responsible. And that's only if the accused is suffering from insane automatism. If the accused is suffering from non-insane automatism, the verdict is an absolute acquittal. So, a successful defense of mental disorder will result in a verdict of not criminally responsible on account of mental disorder uh, as dictated by section 672.34 of the criminal code. And under section 672.54, an accused who receives this qualified acquittal may be discharged absolutely, discharged conditionally, or detained in a hospital. So that, in a nutshell, is how the defense of not criminally responsible due to mental disorder works in the Canadian criminal justice system. I'm not going to give my own opinion of whether we should or should not have this defense, but feel free to give your own opinion in the comment section or even try to apply the test to Manassian's case and give your own verdict. Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed this video.